In the name of the God of creation who loves us all, amen. One day in early summer, many years ago, I was home from college and visiting my grandparents at their small farm in North Georgia. Their house was perched on a hill beneath a lovely grove of oak trees with an open field off the front porch and gardens to either side. My grandfather placed a hammock between two of the oak trees and it was among my favorite places in all the world. On this particular day, I recall dozing in the hammock after breakfast, afloat on a sea of summer breezes and dappled oak leaf shadows and smells from the garden, sung to sleep by the birds that my grandparents faithfully fed. As I awoke, the first image I saw was my grandmother's quilts, five or six of them hanging on a clothesline nearby, airing out in the dear, sweet, summer freshness of the country air. Although I had grown up with her lovingly crafted quilts, had slept beneath them on long, cold winter nights, it was as if in that instant I saw them for the first time, created from scraps of old ties, shirts, patches on patches on pants, and even the occasional vivid scrap of discarded dishcloth. They seemed to blaze with color and design and appeared on fire in the summer morning sun, reflecting back a light that seemed to generate from each individual design, each carefully chosen, yet lovingly random addition to whole cloth. These works of art, and I now realize that is what they are, were created of the ordinary bits and pieces of my grandparents' lives, everyday scraps of common experience and woven into a delightful incarnational narrative, a tapestry of love and care. Like the gospel text for today, those quilts, even now as I hold them in my mind's eye and in my heart, Remind me of the abundance of God's love into which we live during this season of Lent. Before that summer day, I'd never noticed, I'd never really seen those quilts for what they were, the lovingly crafted and redeemed tapestries of my grandmother's love of life, her love for us a reflection of her ability to create outward and visible signs of her gifts and graces to warm us and delight us. And so it is, friends, with Mary in today's Gospel. Think about this with me for just a minute. Every time she appears in each of the Gospels, her compassion opens Jesus' heart, and the texts are informed by her gracious abundance. Now I'm the father of two sons of whom I am so very proud, and I am so grateful for the men who have mentored, guided, shaped me, teachers, professors, football and track coaches, priests and colleagues, some of whom are right here this morning who have served as guides on the journey. But I have also been profoundly formed by the lavish and abundant love of maternal compassion. And let us remember that compassion is the cardinal virtue of the Anglican pastoral tradition. I've been formed by women like my grandmother who have loved and cared for me. 
Compassion, the Hebrew root of which means wombish or womb-like, is a powerful image in today's gospel text. And I believe that God's abundant love is like the nurture and care of the womb where we are sustained and nourished and from which loving embrace we are given life. Even this space is like that. So Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, with whom she shares a home, embodies that generous, extravagant compassion in today's text. And we know of other times, don't we? At least twice Jesus comes to this place for dinner. The Last Supper will be held here, and Jesus appears on Easter to the disciples in Mary's home. There is no other home in which Jesus appears as often as he does this one. But even more remarkable is the complexity of relationship he shares with Mary, how he so clearly cares for her and in relation to whose actions he finds meaning and solace. We remember she sits at his feet among the men to be near him, to learn from him. We remember that earlier her sister Martha complains that Mary is neglecting the work of serving food and drink to their guests. And Jesus defends her, saying she has chosen the good portion and it will not be taken away from her. When her brother Lazarus is desperately ill, Jesus hears the news from his disciples and takes the time to journey to their home. We know that Lazarus dies before Jesus arrives. Martha goes to him in the road with words of regret, even reproach, but also resignation. Mary, though, runs to him and falls at his feet in tears, her sobs breaking his heart. And he too weeps, his tears brought forth by her compassion, his heart welling up in response to her. And for her he rushes to Lazarus' grave, calling him with such power to come out. Now we read the tale of Jesus' arrival at their home six days before Passover, and he'll be their guest for a week. They throw a feast in his honor. Lazarus is there, resurrected just days earlier. Mary brings out a jar of costly perfume and anoints his head, his hair, and then even using her own hair, his feet. All in the room are joined in an embrace of fragrance, and we hear that Judas is angry, and as he says, the extravagance of the gesture bothers him. He declares the perfume could have been sold for a large sum and used to feed the poor, and again, Jesus protects her. Leave her alone, he says. You will always have the poor, but you will not always have me. No, there is no one else in the Gospels for whom Jesus feels so tender, is so responsive, so protective, and with whom he chooses to be such a frequent guest. We know the most astonishing of his miracles, the raising of Lazarus, for which miracle John says the authorities chose to kill him, was done in part for love of her. And according to Luke, Jesus declared that she would be remembered always for doing a beautiful thing for him, for anointing his hair and feet. So you see, my friends, in today's gospel, we are treated to two different ways of being in the world. Two examples of how one might confront scarcity. And is so often true of the Bible, it contains wisdom for the ages for us all. 
We humans are often so consistent down through history, and we see this in both the Pharisees and the Roman authorities who feel their fiefdoms threatened. And in the face of the loss of control, they choose to tighten their grip. By plotting to kill Jesus, they hope to stop their sense of helplessness in its tracks by exerting whatever control they can. Mary, on the other hand, has a different approach. We don't know exactly what she's feeling when she slips from the table and kneels at Jesus' feet. However, her silence, to me, speaks volumes. In gratitude for her brother's life, in grief for the life of her friend, perhaps in fear for what is about to happen, she is silent. And so instead of speaking, she lavishes Jesus with an absurdly expensive gift in a profound gesture of abundance. Yes, in this little story, we see that there are at least two ways of dealing with our fears born of scarcity. We can seek control in ways that ultimately, paradoxically, keep us in bondage. Or we can give all we've got. I confess that in some ways I understand Judas and his theology of scarcity. It's hard for me to say. Many of us have probably been there before. We found ourselves uncomfortable in the face of generosity. We may have even criticized it in order to limit its power. And I suspect we've also probably stood alongside Mary and allowed ourselves to give to our heart's content to lavish our love on someone or something only to have our motives questioned and thereby increasing our vulnerability. We may become afraid to risk its happening again. Sometimes our culture and maybe our human nature pressures us to take only measured risks. And perhaps sometimes this is wise. But I believe God calls us to love without counting the cost. As George Herbert, our patron poet and priest, has said, Lord, I have invited all, and I shall still invite, still call to Thee. For it seems but just and right in my sight, where there is all, there all should be. It could be, dear ones, a brave new Lenten discipline to engage in the final days of this season, to give as Mary would, to love generously because we can, to give life to our impulse to give abundantly, just as God gives abundantly. And just as this gospel text is Jesus' anointing and preparation for death, so here in this moment John is giving us a glimpse into what our relationship towards gratitude might be through the gift of Mary. I'm so very grateful for my grandmother, whose quilts were outward and visible signs of her love for her family. They covered us in times of joy and sadness, and the love they represent lives on in my heart, and now I'm sharing that right now with all of you. And they helped me to understand the extravagance of Mary's love for Jesus, and in turn, anoint his love for all of us. In her quiet and devoted imaginative quilting, my grandmother pointed to something bigger than herself. Just as Mary, in anointing Jesus, draws our attention to the one whom she anoints. I'm so grateful for Mary's example, too, for the gift of her extravagant and life-giving compassion and generosity. 
because she reminds us that Jesus is God's gift to each of us right here, right now. And it seems so needed, doesn't it? Because in so many ways we are in a time of perceived scarcity and fear and surrounded by the behaviors to which these give birth. And yet Mary's gestures here and throughout Scripture gathered together like the redeemed and resurrected scraps of fabric in my grandmother's quilts are an invitation to an alternative way of being in the world. And so I think back now across the years to that summer morning and I know that my grandmother's love lives in my heart and continues to expand like the very universe we inhabit, God's gift to all of us. Just as our Eucharistic table is a place of grace and compassion where even Judas would be welcome and remember he stayed for dinner. There we find extravagant gifts of compassion and grace. Isn't it funny? Mary does not say a word in this text, nor does she need to. As another Mary, another of my maternal teachers has said so well, Lord, I will learn also to kneel down into the world of the invisible, the inscrutable, the everlasting. Then I will move no more than the leaves of a tree on a day of no wind, bathed in light, like the wanderer who has come home at last and kneels in peace, done with all unnecessary things, every motion even words. Amen.